The goal of this video is to introduce accumulation functions, or what we might say, building new functions from old by using definite integrals. But first, a note on helper variables. Suppose that you were looking at the summation of k squared, k equals 1 to 3, and n squared, n equals 1 to 3, and you ask what's the difference between these two summations. Well, if you unravel the sigma notation on the left-hand side, you're going to get 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, which gives you 14. And of course, if you unravel the summation notation on the right side, you're going to get exactly the same result. But perhaps more important than noticing that you get the same number is that even before you evaluate the sum, you should notice that really what both of these notations give you is the same procedure, which by itself, if you looked at the sum 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, has no reference to any kind of variable name like k or n. So what's really going on with this summation notation is that you can think of this variable n or k or whatever you use as a sort of placeholder and the name is really irrelevant. What you really need from this notation is three bits of information really. What's the rule for calculating terms? Where do you start? And where do you stop? And if somehow your notation gives you these three bits of information then the variable name is really quite irrelevant. Let's look at an analog with integration. What's the difference between these two definite integrals? You can probably anticipate the answer already, but let's just look at the details. If you evaluate the definite integral on the left side, we can do this using, say, the fundamental theorem. We can find an antiderivative of x squared, 1 third x cubed, substitute 3 and 1, and we're going to get 26 thirds. And of course, we could evaluate the right-hand integral using the same method. Find the antiderivative 1 third t cubed, substitute 3 and 1, and we get 26 thirds. And once again, perhaps more relevant than uh, noticing that you get the same number in the end is really these are both notations which are telling you about a process, and that process, even before you get the answer, is the same no matter what your variable name, x or t. So um, you can think of this integral as something that perhaps doesn't deserve a variable at all. It's the same story as our summation question. Um, the variable name is irrelevant. What does this definite integral symbol need to tell you? It needs to tell you which function are you trying to integrate, and you need to know where do you start and where do you stop. And somehow if you know all this information, then you have enough information to evaluate the definite integral. By the way, what does the definite integral give you? It gives you a signed area. And if you look at the picture on the left, you'll notice that nowhere in sight do we need to give a name to the variable along the horizontal axis. In other words, the variable name is intrinsically useless to this process. You just need to understand the function and the interval and if you can calculate that signed area, there's no reason to even give a name to the helper variable in the integrand. Now on to our new definition. So we're going to think about the general process of finding new functions from old, and we're going to draw an analogy with something you're quite familiar with already. Sometimes it's really important for us to take an old function lying about, and from that old function, find a new function that describes some feature of the old function. It sounds very abstract, but you've already uh, become quite familiar with one, and that is the tangent slope function. So given a function f, you want to find, in many cases, a new function, the tangent slope function, that describes what? Well, it's a function, the value of which at any argument x is the slope of the line tangent to the graph of f at x. That's a mouthful. Of course, it's much easier to sort of imagine what's going on with a picture, the value of the tangent slope function at a particular x is just the tangent slope. And if you change x, you're going to get a different slope. So here's your function. You choose the x, and the value of the tangent slope function is the slope of the tangent on the graph of f. Here's our new function. It's going to be called an accumulation function. It's a function, the value of which at any argument x is the signed area under the graph of f on the interval from 0 to x. 
Once again, this is a mouthful and it's probably much easier to just take a picture. You take your old function f and for any particular value of x, the value of your new function is going to be the signed area on the interval from 0 to x. As you change x, you're going to get different values. So generally, once you've picked an x, the value of the accumulation function is going to be the signed area on the interval from 0 to x. Now, we should point out that we could use some other starting point. We're not obliged to start at 0. 0 is often used as a starting point, but you could start anywhere in the domain to build an accumulation function. And we'll say more about this in a few moments. Now, in the case of tangent slope functions, we have a nice notation for this idea. It's called f prime. Notice that the notation for derivative is actually reinforcing the idea that your new function has something to do with the old function. So it's f prime. It has, it's a new function that's based on the old function. At this point, you've been using shortcuts to evaluate f prime of x, like the power rule, chain rule, and so on. But remember that uh, the foundation of the tangent slope function is that it is calculated as a limit of secant slopes. So here's our definition. f prime of x is equal to this limiting value as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. It's a limit of secant slopes. And you'll notice that the argument x is what you really care about because you choose the x, that's going to change the value of the tangent slope. But there's another variable in this uh, formula here, h, and we can think of that as being one of these helper variables. In other words, its name doesn't matter. If we called this u or t, it just would not matter because the limiting value at the chosen argument x, that limiting value would be the same no matter what you call the little helper variable that sneaks up to x. Unfortunately, there's no standard notation for accumulation function, so we're just going to call this function a and it but there is a way a very well defined way of calculating this since we're looking for a signed area we need a definite integral so we're going to evaluate a of x by integrating on the interval from 0 to x the function f now you'll notice that x is the argument we care about you change x and you change the signed area uh, in question but there's another variable floating around in this formula. It's t here, and we can think of that as just a helper variable. And you'll notice, just as we discussed moments ago, the name of this variable is irrelevant. We could call it u, we could call it w, we could call it box and not even give it a name. So try to keep that in mind as you move forward. What's really going on with this accumulation function, the variable you want to keep your eye on is x, because that's the one that determines the value of the function. And the name of the helper variable is irrelevant. So here's our definition based on an accumulation that has a starting point at 0. But you could ask what happens when you change the starting point. So let's just talk about that for a second. What's the difference between this accumulation function and this accumulation function. Please know what we're asking here. We're building two different accumulation functions using two different starting points. So we're using k in the first instance and l in the second. Notice, however, we are using the same integrand. It's the function f in both cases. Let's get a picture of what's going on. Suppose you have some function f and you start your accumulation at l in one case and you start it at k in the other. So here's a picture that simultaneously shows us the value a k of x and a l of x. And, and as you change x, you're going to change the value of both. And what we're interested in is the literal difference between these two functions. So we're going to take a l of x minus a k of x. Just plug in our formulas in terms of definite integrals and let's just see what we get. The first thing we'll notice is that we can use a law of integration that says if you integrate a function from l to x, we could of course break that into an integral from l to k and then add the integral k to x and the sum of those two integrals will give us the original integral. And once we do this, then we're going to cancel out these contributions and what's left is this definite integral from l to k. Please notice that l and k are constants and so this number is a constant and it is in fact the difference of the two accumulation functions. So the difference is literally in other words, you take one minus the other, and that difference is literally a constant, and that constant can be interpreted as the signed area of the original integrand function f from l to k. So here's a fundamental question. What does an accumulation function measure? 
And the quick answer is net change. Let's take a look at a concrete example. Oil starts to leak from a drum at time t equals zero minutes. The rate of flow is given by this function, 10 t e to the negative t squared over 10, where r, the rate, is measured in gallons per minute and t is measured in minutes. How much oil flows from the drum from time t equals zero to time t equals x? Well, we could plot r and notice that apparently the leak starts slow and then the rate increases until it starts to die off again. But what we're interested in is choosing a time, call it x, and we're trying to figure out the net change of oil in the drum. In other words, we're going to integrate the rate function on the interval from 0 to x. Now we have a new way of thinking about this function. This is an accumulation function. We're taking the rate function and we're integrating from 0 to a variable time x. And so this would be an example of an accumulation function. But what this accumulation function is telling us is the net change in oil from the drum. In other words, the amount of oil that has leaked out. As x changes, the amount changes. Let's use the online graphing utility Desmos to explore this example further. We'll enter the rate function uh, 10x e to the negative x squared over 10, and then we're going to enter the accumulation function directly. If you type int, it will plug in the integral template and you can put in the limits of integration, the integrand, and so on. And notice that we're using a dummy variable t. If you try to use the same variable, you will get uh, an error. Like, uh, Desmos does not like you trying to use x for two very different purposes, one as a helper variable and one as the upper limit of integration. So you have to choose a dummy variable. So Here's the uh, graph, simultaneous graph, of the original rate function and the net change function, the accumulation function. And let's just pick an example to see if this is reasonable. We'll choose the argument 2, and we'll notice that if you find the signed area under the rate, change, uh, rate of change function, you could approximate this area with a triangle and has base 2 and height 15 so the area here the accumulated area is about 15 and you will notice that the other graph the value of that graph is roughly 15 so at least at the argument 2 it seems to make sense now let's use this graph to answer a question um, approximately how much oil leaked out after eight minutes so we're trying to figure out the accumulated area under this graph. Well, if we believe the accumulation function is doing what it's supposed to, instead of trying to approximate that area, we should just look at the value of the function a itself. And we'll notice that a appears to have a horizontal asymptote at the value 50. So we can answer this question pretty easily. It looks like after eight minutes, 50 gallons has spilled. And by the way, there isn't going to be much more that spills. That's about all the oil there must have been in the barrel. So let's end with uh, this other example. Suppose we have a ball that's launched straight up into the air, so we have motion along a vertical line, and we'll assume that only gravity is working. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the positive y direction to be the direction in, in which both position and velocity are, are increasing. So we're sort of oriented upwards. And the velocity, let's suppose, is given by the function 50 minus 32t. And we'll suppose that t is measured in seconds and the velocity is in feet per second. Let's suppose also that the position of the ball at time 2 is 61 feet off the ground. So s of 2 is 61, and we're measuring s in feet. Here's our question. Our goal is to find the position s as a function of time t. Now, undoubtedly, you have one or two or three different ways to solve this already, but what we want to do right now is to understand this in the context of accumulation functions. So we're going to start with the following observation. The displacement of the ball from time 2 to an arbitrary time t can be thought of two different ways. On the one hand, it is, by definition, just the change in position from time 2 to time t. In other words, it's s of t minus s of 2, change in position. On the other hand, 
We should also be able to calculate the displacement as the net change. In other words, the definite integral on the interval from 2 to t of the rate of change of position function, otherwise known as the velocity function. So if we integrate velocity from 2 to t, we should also calculate the displacement on the same time interval. Of course, we're going to then be calculating an accumulation function. So in this example, an accumulation function is essentially allowing us to write down a solution directly. Because if s of t minus s of 2 is equal to this, then we can just solve for s of t. This is our position function. Now, of course, if we want to make it more explicit, we need to substitute in some information. So we know what s of 2 is. It was given to us. And we know how to calculate this definite integral using the fundamental theorem. So we'll plug in that information and work out the details. And in the end, you get the function negative 16t squared plus 50t plus 25. Now we should check that this position function actually satisfies the requirements of the problem. Before we do that, we'll uh, make the warning that there's an ambiguous domain here. You should be careful about um, what interval, uh, what t interval you expect this to actually tell you what the position is. But putting that aside, we need to check that s of 2 really is 61 and that the velocity really is 50 minus 32t. Well, we can just plug in 2 and when all the dust settles, we see that indeed we get 61. So we're good there. And then, of course, we can take the derivative, not too difficult in this case, negative 32t plus 50. And so that is indeed what our velocity function is. And so it looks good. We've got a solution to the problem. Now, let's think about this for a second. This was the act of differentiation. To go from s to the velocity function is exactly uh, the process of differentiation. But what did we do to find the position function? We accumulated the velocity. So we took the velocity as the integrand for our accumulation function. So this leads us to wonder, is there a relationship here that generalizes? So is it true that you take a function and you use it to build an accumulation function? Is it going to be true that when you differentiate, you get back the original function? Because if that's true, then accumulation functions are really nothing more or less than antiderivatives of the original function. And the answer to this question is yes, accumulation functions are always going to give you antiderivatives, but that's the subject of a different video.